Hi guys, hope you are well. Today I'm back with another episode of my interview series and today I have with me the amazing Sara Kevar. Sara Kevar is a PhD student in cultural studies, science and technological studies as well as an editor with Stone of Madness and Swallow Tales Literary Presses. They are genderless, gen- uh, yonderless and several transman writings are found in forthcoming in Disability Studies Quarterly, Bitch Magazine, Feral Feminisms, Electric Lit and Elsewhere. And their third chapter book out of mind and into bodies available now from Ethan Press. Hi Sarah, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope everything is fine at your end. Yes, I hope I hope the same for you. It's great to be here. I'm really glad we found the time. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh Kiva, we'll start from the beginning. So tell me what inspired you to start writing in the first place and how important do you think writing it is for you now that you have been writing for like so many years? Yeah, so I mean, I think as many writers can probably relate to, I started writing just because I had all these stories in my head as a kid. Um and I need a place to put them. Um I would first, you know, act them out and then when I got stronger as a writer, I would write them down. Um and that really just escalated throughout middle school um i wrote you know a very bad short story collection and a very bad novella when i was in middle school and high school um and i think that it was about in the middle of high school that i actually began to take writing seriously um largely because i had a really great english teacher um and around that time i was funneling more of my energy into essays into poetry um and i was thinking more seriously about the career options for me as a writer um then when i was 17 um i went away to college and i came across a call for submissions um by a now defunct journal that i love a lot um called the mad scientist journal um and for some reason their call for submissions like sparked something in me um so i wrote a story I was super scared and I submitted it. Um it was my first ever submission to like a non-school related publication because I'd been in the school literary magazine but not like a no a real one. Um and I was accepted somehow. And that first acceptance sort of I guess gave me the confidence to like keep submitting. Um I had always been writing but then I realized like oh like I can share this in publications and be like a professional writer whatever that means. Um So yeah, ever since then I have been writing, submitting, working, you know, most of what I received in the beginning were rejections. Um but because that first submission did happen to be an acceptance, um I felt like I was worthy enough to to go on. And I think like what I feel like what's not talked about is writing and publishing is not only about the kind of joy and need I feel to right and to get words out it's also about the validation about knowing that people are reading your work and knowing that people are really appreciating it for what it is um so that that has been a huge driving factor in me getting the stories and poems and essays out of my head and into you know a text format um just knowing that there might be someone out there who really appreciates it um and that a journal might be willing to say hey this is good enough to to share with the world and to host permanently on our site that sounds so interesting because it's so nostalgic because listening to your story you know reminded me of mine and you know it's so much fun when you get your the first acceptance uh, and yeah. matters the most i mean because it keeps you going on so now that you know you have been uh, submitting for a while now so how uh, have you changed or how has your submission process has changed has it evolved in any way how do you see it now yeah totally So I read somewhere and I don't recall who said this, but someone asked them um like on their blog or something like how do you choose where to submit? And the person just said I submit where I read. Um and obviously when you're starting out with Larry magazine this at least for me, I was not familiar with and I hadn't been reading them for very long. Um I wasn't reading very many. Um so I think a big part of my like initial struggle to get published in a lot of places was just that well one i didn't quite understand what magazines wanted um and two i didn't quite know where my work fit best 
Um, so I was just kind of just randomly sending out things like everywhere that had a call for submissions. I was also trying to write two specific calls rather than writing the work and like seeing where it, you know, fit best. Um, and really like, really I think caring more about getting the work out there quickly rather than finding a home for it. Um, I think a lot of that change, not only with time, but also with taking on more like reader and editorial positions. Because when you're on the other side of that, you really get a sense of like, this is what it means to submit to a journal. This is what it want, means to want to join a journal. This is what a journal might be interested in. Um, so I actually think that being on Stone of Madness and then getting into other editorial and readership roles has probably changed my submission pattern the most. Um, I submit a lot less now. I submit to a lot more, like a much tighter circle of journals that I really want to be in. Um, and I don't get as upset when a particular story, a particular poem doesn't find a home um, because I trust that if it's right, then it will. And if it's not, I can, you know, tinker with it or use it later. Um, I think I'm a lot less desperate now. Um, and to a degree, I think all writers are, are desperate. Um, but to get to a place where I feel confident enough that I've had enough things published that I'm okay, um, makes it a lot easier for me to be relaxed about the things that have not been published yet, instead of just throwing them at any publication that I see. Okay, so uh, you have talked about your, um, you know, editorial site. So I want to talk to you about that. So uh, now that you have been editing uh, journals, I would say on the other side of the table instead yeah. of the one that you have been previously on. So uh, how do you see writing now? How has your relationship is like with with writing? And when you, whenever you uh, get to read other people's uh, works, so do you uh, secretly compare it with yours and, you know, come think and introspect on your own? work based on that how is that like oh yeah of course it is in everyone I mean like I'm like I'm a very like competitive person so I feel like it's inevitable that when I read someone's work that's really good you know even if I'm you know accepting it for publication I'm like oh god am I ever going to be that good you know I have the honor of editing this am I ever going to be this creative you know this eloquent um and I think it's a really toxic attitude that at least I oftentimes fall into, and I think many others can, can you know, also relate to. Um, I think slowly though, as I'm editing, I'm getting better about recognizing that comparing two people's writing is really like comparing apples and oranges. Like they're just so fundamentally different and they serve two different purposes. Um, and ultimately, as much as I admire, you know, this person's or that person's writing, um, aspiring to write like them would be pretty stupid because you know the point isn't to make two copies of the same kind of writer the point is to grow into the kind of writer that i am because um people who read my writing want to read me not them um so i think slowly learning to accept that my improvement is not contingent on me being more like the writers I admire, even if I'm able to incorporate elements of writers whose work I enjoy, because, you know, that's really powerful and they have great things to say. Um, really, I think leaning into my own uniqueness has helped. Um, but I will say, you know, I'm human. I'm like, when I edit a really good piece of writing, I'm like, oh God, like, who gave you the right to to edit this, you know, will I ever be like this? Um, but then just recognizing that, you know, that's this person's path. This person entrusted me with their work for a reason. Um, and I have my own path and I will entrust my work to other editors who might feel the same way. It's all a cycle. So uh, what exactly do you like in a poem that, you know, just makes you wow you know it's it's amazing so how how uh, is there any any poem any writer that you would like to um, you know give shout out to and or, or talk about and any of their work who have really you know uh, amazed you in, in in any way with their work 
So in terms of writers that I myself have published, I'll have to give a shout out to Nora Hikari. Um, Nora is, I, so I first published her work in the um, like madness issue of um, Anomaly Lit that I curated the folio for last year. Um, and now I'm publishing her again in the Trans is the Future, the Future is Trans um, issue of Be Stung. And her work is just really, really marvelous speculative poetry, um, really engaging with the trans body as a site of speculation, um, regardless of whether it's in you know, the future or now or the past. Um, and I think thinking about trans bodies, disabled bodies, mad bodies as sites of speculation is really one of my favorite um, themes to work with in poetry because it really destabilizes what speculative even means, um, what science fiction even means. It doesn't relegate science fiction as something that happens way far in the future. It's like science fiction is happening now. Science fiction has already happened. Um, and I find that really compelling. Um, in terms of writers that I have not published, but you know, would be a dream too, um, would be Kim Hai Soon. Um, she's a Korean writer. I believe Don Mi Choi uh, translates her. Um, Don Mi Choi is the author of DMZ Colony, I believe. Um, and Kim Hai Soon's writing is just really frightening and sublime body horror about you know gender and madness. And like growing up, you know, in the legacy of intergenerational and national trauma. Um, and it's really, really brutal. And I like a poet whose work is just, it just, it's violent. It comes at you with a sword. Um, you know, it doesn't take any prisoners. And I think it's very, very daring to do that in a world that, you know, increasingly wants people to portray their trauma in a very palatable way, um, wants to police the language that we use to talk about our experiences. Um, so to see a writer who just completely just ignores that, just completely says fuck that and does whatever they want, um, it's really, really wonderful to see. Um, and it's wonderful to encounter poetry that makes me physically go like, oh my God, um, like that's what I want. Like I want poetry that like feels like it's like attacking me. That sounds so much fun. So, uh, what what kind of themes do you uh, actually explore in your writing? If you would like to share. Yeah. So I mean, like I'm oftentimes exploring the same themes, and I think I'm I'm influenced a lot by people like Kim Hai Soon. Definitely. Um, I know like the full length collection that I'm working on now. Um, the the first or like the I guess titular poem in it was published in Electric Lit, I believe, last year on um, differential diagnosis. That was heavily influenced by um, High Soon's writing style. Um, and I really enjoy incorporating not only speculative writing and not only body horror, but absurdism um, and surrealism into my work, making statements that sound crazy on their face, things that don't quite make sense. Um, and using poetry as a way to sort of trouble what sense-making means. Um, and I really enjoy the possibilities of language there, the ability to use language in ways that just don't make sense in prose, um, in ways that, you know, wouldn't make sense if you said them in, you know, real life. But using poetry as a space to say, you know, how can I sort of hide from real life? How can I find an escape hatch out of real life? Um, so I guess if I were to sum up my the themes that I write about into one sort of phrase, it would be finding that escape hatch from real life, whatever that looks like. So we have been talking about your writing style. So now I want to ask you, what's your process of writing? Because that sounds, that, you know, after our conversation and the way we, you are describing your things and the way you seek inspiration. Now I'm very fascinated to, you know, how do you approach writing, the writing, the art of writing itself in terms of, uh, you know, crafting something whenever, you know, you get the time. How do you do that? So my writing process is first and foremost grounded in reading. Um, I was actually telling a friend the other day that I feel like reading a really good book is like porn for writing. It like really like gets you like, you know, in the mood and then you can't help but like do something with all of that energy. Um, and that's really how I feel 
you know, I was reading Inferno by Eileen Miles yesterday and I wanted to finish it. And it's, you know, I started it as research for, you know, a longer project that I'm writing. Um, but I was reading it, reading it, reading it. And then I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I have to start writing. Um, and then I ended up, yeah, actually I ended up writing a new short story um, just based on, on that. And the way I used language and the themes I was thinking about were so rooted in um, what Miles was talking about in Inferno. And I feel like that happens again and again for me. Um, I read books, I read novels, I read poetry, I read essays that are so good. And then I'm like, this language has just like possessed me and I just need to start. Um, I do write like every day. Um, I work in one of my long projects every day because um, I like the model of, you know, even if it's just a word or a sentence or a paragraph, um, doing a little bit every day gets the project done eventually. Um, but when it comes to the actual quantity of things that I write and also like the non-long project things that I write, I really go based on vibes. And I have, you know, some periods where I'm reading a lot and writing a lot. And then I have some periods where I'm just reading a lot. Um, and I have some periods where really like my creative writing is on the back burner because I'm also a student. Um, and I'm also reading academic work and writing academic work and grading papers. Um, so really I have like a baseline, like I do write a little bit every day, no matter what. Um, but like, if you're thinking about, you know, when am I writing, you know, full length stories and poems and things like that, um, it really waxes and wanes. And oftentimes based on the amount of time I have to read um, and what I'm reading. That sounds really, really fascinating. Now I'm, you know, more eager to read some more of your work and, you know, also your collection. So I get to know, like, you know, where all these gems are coming from. <laughs> okay, so uh, tell me that since you are also into writing short stories apart from poems, so uh, uh, I'm very curious to know that uh, why have you started uh, writing uh, uh, both of them? Like some because a lot a lot of people uh, are you know into short stories if, if they if they write poetry. So is that because you feel that there are certain limitations to the art of poetry that you feel more uh, comfortable in expressing through a short story, or is there any other reason? So actually, I started off writing only short stories and essays um, because I was exposed to such a limited, you know, like Shakespeare's sonnets um, and this very traditional, these traditional forms of poetry in school. I thought I hated poetry. Um, I thought I wanted nothing to do with poetry. I couldn't write poetry, I didn't like it. Um, and so I was writing basically only prose. But <laughs> discovering and reading more poetry, I realized that poetry can be whatever the hell you want it to be. Um, and that there's really no limit for the kinds of form and genre and, you know, unconventional approaches you can take in poetry. And once I felt I had access to that freedom, um, poetry became not so much like a singular genre that I funneled all my work into, but a kind of style that ended up pervading all of my work. Um, whether that work is classified as poetry or whether it's you know, classified as prose. Um, and increasingly, whether it's classified as sort of hybrid or experimental. Um, so really becoming someone who writes a lot of poetry was less a matter of you know, me stumbling upon poems at an early age and then later branching out into other genres. It was really realizing that poetry was an opportunity to branch out from prose. Um, and that poetry oftentimes can provide a little bit of extra magic um, when a writing process needs it. I see. Okay, so uh, you know when I was actually reading your bio, when we were when, when we were even talking, so I really was very fascinated to know that you know you are into both things because it's very rare that you come across somebody who uh, you know writes uh, short stories, essays, as well as poems. So yeah, that was something really you know uh, fascinating for me. Okay, so uh, Kivar, you are also a PhD student in like cultural studies, science and technology. So how does your multifaceted academic background translate? into your stories, your essays, or your poems? Um, so it's, I mean, it's a little bit difficult sometimes because um, 
you know, I'm trying to reach both a non-academic audience and an academic one. And it doesn't always succeed um, in doing both. Um, journals don't always want things with an academic tone. Um, and academic journals certainly are very, like they, they really gatekeep any sort of creative interventions. And it's really, really frustrating. Um, I think over time though, I've both been able to introduce concepts that I'm working with in scholarship um, into my you know, creative writing in ways that feel approachable and in ways that feel beautiful. Um, and I've also been able to find magazines and presses that have you know, other PhD students, other people who are interested in the same things that I am um, running them and that provide an open space to you know, explore academic concepts in, in creative writing. Um, and really to, to, to really end the binary between academic and creative writing, um, which I think is my goal. So, I mean, to think about specifics, I mean, my most recent chapbook, Out of Mind and the Body, incorporates a ton, not only of my lived experiences, you know, really traumatic ones, um, but also, you know, reading about Foucault and reading about power, reading about medicine and prisons and disability studies. Um, and, you know, if poetry is really one of the lenses through which I see the world, that's going to be inevitably touched by the academic information that I'm consuming. The academic information I'm consuming becomes part of my life experience and then part of my poetry. Um, so I think if anything, you know, despite having some difficulties figuring out where to place that work that, that incorporates a lot of academic theory, um, it's also sort of vital to the way that I see the world. And I don't think my poetry is possible without it. So uh, while I was listening to uh, your, uh, you know, bit about your uh, academic writing as well as your poetry and your efforts into uh, merging the two forms together and coming up with something even creative. Mm -hmm. So I actually came up with an idea that maybe you can start a journal or maybe you can start a theme in the journals that you are currently a part of. Uh, uh, something like that you can, uh, you know, come up with a theme where you would be, uh, you know, you can say that, you know, this is going to be an academic theme, uh, you know, my and you know where people and anybody who has been a part of academic circle and also writes uh, poetry or any uh, short story so they can also get the platform there where they can uh, submit their work or get it published or maybe you can start a journal that's uh, purely based on that because I remember I saw a journal where uh, you know they uh, allow writers especially physicists and all those scientists that mm -hmm. they uh, who are also into poetry that they can merge those two forms together and coming up yeah. with crazy ideas so maybe you can also start something like that that will help you you know take both sides of your both parts of your world and just merge them together. Definitely. And I know that like Swallowtail Press, which is the small press that I co-founded, um, does like a lot of the books that we publish are really straddling that line between the creative and the academic. And it's really it's wonderful to provide space for those books to, to thrive. I'm really happy to know that that you're already doing that. But if you ever plan to come up with something or want to discuss it or, you know, want me to help you in any way, then feel free to, you know, reach out to me in any, in, in any way. Because I'm actually currently working on my goal. So because of that, I know a lot of journals who are, you know, doing similar things or, you know, even crazier things. So I can, you know, maybe give you some ideas or maybe even, uh, I, you know, uh, help you reach out to editors. So that might be helpful for you. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. So uh, you are also uh, working on your third book, and I think it's been out from Ethel Press, which is Out of mm -hmm. Mind and Into Body. So first of all, title, Kudus. I loved it. <laughs> I want to ask you about the title and just walk me through the entire process of, you know, working on that collection and getting it published. And, you know, I'm very excited to the, know about the journey of that book from you. So that was actually, chronologically, that was my first chapbook. Um, I, like I first started working on the poems that ended up being in that book before anything else. Um, and it took a really long time to find a home for it um, because it's kind of weird. Um, so 
In terms of the content, um, basically within that book is a bunch of poems that I've amassed since, oh, probably 2017, from 2017 to 2021, roughly. Um, and really trying to create a narrative that combines the experience of being trans um, and experiencing medical trauma um, and the experience of being disabled, mad, and experiencing institutionalization and really thinking about the violence of institutions and what it does to our genders, to our psyche, um, to how we understand our personhood. Um, and really the title, Out of Mind and Into Body, I mean, like it's a catchy little title that I was very proud to come up with. Um, but I think it also really reflects that I am taking an experience that for so long was relegated to being all in my head. Um, something that was not publicly recognized, something that was not publicly validated. Um, and I am putting it into a physical text. And that physical text, like, materially manifests that experience. Um, you know, I, that, that experience is part of my body of work. Um, and in that way, it's sort of, I mean, there are still people who don't trust, you know, narratives of disabled people um, or trans people or whomever. Um, but the title out of mind and into body indicates that that experience is not like lost in the ephemera of my mind. Yeah. So, I mean, basically just the title out of mind and into body indicates, um, these experiences that I've had going from something that's deemed all in my head, something that's easily dismissible, um, into a form that's physically readable. You can engage with it. Um, you can buy it. Um, and I think that materializing those experiences in, in the very literal form of a chapbook um, would be powerful under conditions where our narratives as disabled people, as trans people, as mad people, whatever, um, have so long been relegated to, you know, that's all in your head, you're imagining things. Um, and the only textual documents that are produced about us are written by doctors. Um, we really don't get an actual voice of our own. Um, so out of mind and into body in many ways is kind of like a counter text. Um, it's kind of a, a form of pushing back against the reports written about us without our consent. Um, and the poems in it are really gesturing basically to my side of the story when it comes to diagnosis and medical intervention. Um, it's sharing the history that I want to share, sharing the context that I want to share, and also leaving blank spaces. You know, I leave literal blank spaces um, in a lot of my poems in that because it's like, you don't have to know. And like, I don't want you to know. Um, and even being able to, to exert that kind of control over one's own story um, is itself a way of fighting back. And to textualize that resistance is even better. I, I really want to uh, praise you and congratulate you for bringing out your narrative because uh, in the media and, you know, amidst all the uproar that's been going on since like ages about this issue. So, you know, I'm really, really, uh, you know, proud of you that, you know, you have decided to put out your narrative. So, yeah. Thank high five. you so much. Virtual high five. Thank Okay, so now I would request you to share any of your poems that you have written and would like to share with the audience. So the floor is all, is all yours. Yes, uh, do you mean read them aloud? Or Sorry? just like, Sorry? do you mean read them aloud or just titles? Uh, no, 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 no. Just read the entire poem, whatever you want to read. The, the, this is all your time. Okay. Um, so I... So the PDF of Out of Mind Into Body um, is actually available for free on Ethel Press's website. Um, and so if people like at home are following along and want to enjoy it, download it, read it, um, they're more than welcome to. Um, I'm gonna open the PDF myself and kind of like scroll randomly and see what I land on. I don't know if that's the best uh, option, but I'm going to, Let's see. 
actually I landed on one of my favorites, um, which was first published in Transat. Um, it's called Aggregation, and it's after um, the poem Making Of by Franny Choi, who is another wonderful poet that who is like speculative cyborgian work I enjoy reading. Um, aggregation. Cyborgs are made out of words. Cyborgs are made out of things named cyborgs. Cyborgs are made out of things, only things if you squint at them, just like their male and female counterparts. At midnight, I clasp two hands across my abdomen, pray to be so small and vast the cloud will have me. My prayers are prayers in drag, poems who enumerate in wordless codes fitted to the human throat. Yeah, so that's aggregation. As I was saying, I really love your poem, Kibar. Uh, especially the line, cyborgs are made of words, cyborgs are made of things, just things if you squinted them like man and woman. I, I love these lines, so ama amazing. And, you know, if you want to read another poem, then, you know, feel free. So if you want, I can read one of my poems that uses a lot of empty space, and I'm going to try to reflect the empty space in my reading aloud. Um, so, and this is part, like, there are two parts to this, but I'm going to read the first part. Um, so the title is, The Things I'm Afraid to Say Because of Who Might a Story in Erasure. And when I hitch my voice like that, I'm going to try to indicate the erasure. I wish I could tell all the things that frighten me, but truthfully, her seat at the power knowledge nexus amplifies. I'm feeling today and every day so much that all I can do is and when she asked me how can i be of service to you i service wrong because it feels that i've been worse and worse if only i could enough for it to be as scary as it is and then maybe i will read the second one so the second one's called the other it begins in italics with the title of the previous poem um redacted a little bit things that say is who might be echoes the song a mile deep it's mine it's in my cup holder it's in my camera your not mother says the song in my ear a camera taped over so yeah i mean obviously can get a better sense of what I'm doing there um, if you read it in the text. But I'm always looking for new opportunities and new ways to perform um, kind of more difficult to perform poems. So thank you for giving me the space to do that. I, I really loved your poems. I'm so sorry about the internet connection. It's not really allowing me to dig in further in your work. So I apologize for that. But I, I really loved your poems and, you know, amazing work, especially the cyborgs one. It's my favorite. Yeah. So if you have the link, uh, so feel free to share it with me. I'm going oh, to read, sure. read it. Yeah, please feel free to uh, drop it in the chat. I, I'll read it. Uh, Yeah. Uh, also, uh, aggregation. yeah, yeah, please feel free to, you know, uh, send me the link whenever it's feasible for you. Uh, now, you know, I want to ask you to, if you have any message, would you like to give any up, up, up and coming writers who want to uh, make a mark in the field of writing or want to start out writing in the first place? Oh, I would say, I mean, no matter if you're getting published or not, or if that's even your goal, just keep writing. I mean, the worst thing that can happen if you submit is that someone says no. And the best thing that can happen is someone says yes, and you use that as a step on your journey to writing even more. I mean, I cannot stress enough that the world needs more words, especially words from marginalized people. So like, even if you think you're, you're bad, or even if you haven't gotten any acceptances, or, you know, even if people have told you you're not very good, like, the best thing you can do for the world is to keep writing. Um, no matter what, no matter who you are or where you are, the best thing you can do for the world is to keep writing. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would request you to please share your website link or your Twitter handle. So if anybody wants to reach out to you, they can. Yeah, so my name is at Kavar Sarah, um, C-A-V-A-R-S-A-R-A-H. Um, and my website is www.kavar.club. Um, so you can find me there. Um, you can also, and I can send you the link to this too. Um, and 
you can buy a beautiful physical copy of Out of Mind and Into Body um, or download the free PDF version um, on Apple Press's website. So I'm sending you, so here's the um, purchase link and here is a direct link to the PDF. Thank, thank you so much, Kavar, for your time. And I'll definitely share these links in the uh, description of this video. And uh, it was a pleasure meeting you today. And I had a blast talking to you about you so many things uh, during the interview before that. And, you know, thank, thanks yeah. once again for your time. It was a thank pleasure you. meeting this you. Great. This was great. Thank you so much. Have a great day.